Welcome to Emmanuel Church Glenhaven Bible Talks. Our church loves to engage with God's written word, the Bible, as we gather week by week. If you missed a sermon or want to hear it again, we pray that your time here today will refresh and renew you as you follow Jesus. Today we begin a new series of sermons in Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth called Power Made Perfect in Weakness. The church in Corinth was a troubled church. In his letters to the Corinthian Christians, the Apostle Paul confronts many issues that confused and divided them. Paul writes very personally in 2 Corinthians. He opens his heart to them, exposing deep vulnerability. For indeed, Christianity is weak and foolish and unimpressive by design. But God's power is made perfect in our weakness. In this talk, Hayden Smith begins in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians to give us some background to this church. He goes on to give us three reasons why God has chosen an unimpressive message, which unimpressive pastors preach to unimpressive churches, with a view to saving mostly unimpressive people. But before we hear from Hayden, let's listen to the Bible. The passage is 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 18 to chapter 2 verse 5. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It's because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who's become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness and redemption. Therefore, as it's written, that the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now, here's Hayden. Truthfully, a complex 
but rewarding book, we'll need to do a little work to understand the context into which Paul was speaking. And so today, this is the plan. We're going to orient ourselves to this church in Corinth and to this letter. And our hope is that today we'll discover the heart of this book and the heart of the gospel of Jesus. Um, I'm going to pray as we open God's word together. Heavenly Father, we know that every promise is yes in Christ Jesus, and you promise that your word does not return to you empty. And so by your spirit, speak to us today that we would in this new series be shaped more and more in the likeness of Jesus, who was clothed in weakness and foolishness and poverty. For we pray in the name of Jesus, in whom is strength, wisdom and wealth. Amen. Now my notes here say, and it's in quote, Hayden, say something inspiring. All right, how's this? Ready? Emmanuel Church is not my favourite church. Is that, how'd that go? Was that, is that inspiring? There's a sense in which that's true, though. And what I mean by that is not in the sense that it's not my favourite. It's just that if you ask any person who has been in church for a long time and moved to a different church, they'll tell you, you never really leave a church. It stays in your heart. And so I do love this church. But I remember I, this week in the wardrobe, I found a jumper from a previous church. I was reminded of my time in that church. And in fact, uh, earlier this week, I received a message from a godly man named Dan, who was just this past week made a presbyter or priest in the Anglican church. He was in my youth group when I was a 20-year-old youth minister at Barney's Ingleburn in Campbelltown. He messaged me to invite me to the service saying simply, thank you for discipling me all those years ago. And yesterday I texted Gary, who was the senior minister at that same church, Barney's Ingleburn, to let him know that I'm praying for him as his wife is unwell. And I think on Friday, uh, Libby and I are having dinner with friends from, yep, you guessed it, Barney's Ingleburn. You never really leave a church. And how do I compare Barney's Ingleburn with St. Luke's Miranda, the church where I became a Christian and met my wife? Or St. Barnabas Broadway? a church where I learned so much about ministry and a church for us filled with joyful memories. Or this church, Emmanuel Church, a church that has become for us a home, a family that's been very patient with me and my family, a church that we love. They're all my favourites. And as for the Apostle Paul, he had many churches that he loved and he loves the church in Corinth. You can read all about his time in Corinth in Acts chapter 18. You see, Paul was an evangelist. I think we call them church planters nowadays. He went from town to town, from city to city, establishing churches, raising up leaders before moving on to the next place. But in Corinth, he didn't move on to the next place. He stayed there for 18 months and became not just their evangelist, but their pastor. There in Corinth, he met some people who would be lifelong friends and ministry partners, including Priscilla and Aquila, who are mentioned in four books of the Bible as well as Sosthenes, who shed blood with Paul in Corinth and co-authored the first letter to the church in that place. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4, Paul explains that he has written to the church to, quote, let you know the depth of my love for you. And in 2 Corinthians 6, 11, Paul speaks of how he and his fellow apostles are opening wide their hearts to the church in Corinth. Chapter 7, verse 4, he takes great pride in them, which is why he writes to them. He's written to them three times and he's preparing to visit them a third time. And the Corinthian church reciprocates that love for Titus brought the following report to Paul from chapter 7, verse 7 of the second letter. He told us about your longing for me, that is for Paul, your ardent concern for me, and my joy was greater than ever. Paul loves this church and so he writes to them. And he's keen to write and to visit in part because he is concerned for them. He's concerned about the encroaching cultural impact that Corinth is having on the church. The plan was that the city of Corinth would be transformed by the gospel and would become more Christian. And yet Paul's concern is that the Christians were becoming more Corinthian. You may or may not be with, uh, familiar with Corinth. I've not been there. I was speaking to someone after the 8.30 service who was telling me they had been there. Uh, Corinth is located in a very important and prominent position. You see, to its west, if you can imagine it, is the Ionian Sea. And to its east is the Aegean Sea. 
and there is only four kilometres from Corinth to the Aegean Sea. And the alternative, if you want to transport goods from one sea to the other, is either you can go south hundreds of kilometres around the Cape there in Greece and navigate rough waters and the potential for pirates or shipwreck, or you can pull into port safely at Corinth, pay a few dollars and ask them to move the goods and cargo that short distance to the Aegean Sea where another ship will take it on its journey. This made Corinth a crucial trading port and there was a great deal of money to be made there. Whether you were a labourer, whether you were a merchant, you could make some good money in Corinth. But it wasn't just that goods came through Corinth, gods came through Corinth as well. Every person brought different religious ideas which were then contested in the theatres and temples and schools of the city. The great sophists or teachers of wisdom would hold their audiences captive with their powerful stories and flowing speech. And looming large over this spiritual and wealthy city was the temple of Aphrodite, the goddess of love or lust, who was worshipped through sexual licentiousness. In first century slang, if you said someone was quote unquote taking a trip to Corinth, it was code that that person was engaging in promiscuous activities. The city was also a Roman colony and so it enjoyed the protection and prosperity of the empire. The civic influence of Corinth was significant because diplomats and soldiers and politicians would regularly visit Corinth on business and many of them settled there. This was a big and bustling city filled with many ideas. American uh, Bible commentator Gordon Fee described Corinth in the following terms. If you take the brashness and wealth of New York and the vapid glamour of Los Angeles and the debauchery and greed of Las Vegas and combine them, then you have something approaching the ancient city of Corinth. You see, Corinth was a city of self-made people. And these people knew how the world works. The world works on the basis of power and wisdom, vying for honour and influence. Some would say that uh, Corinth was a place for confident people, but perhaps a more accurate description was that Corinth was a boastful city filled with boastful people. And this idea of boasting is so much at the heart of Paul's letters. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6, he says to them plainly, your boasting is no good. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, love does not boast. In fact, in chapter 4, verse 18, some people apparently had become dismissive, questioning the legitimacy of Paul's apostolic authority, questioning whether he'd ever turn up again. And he says of them, some of you have become arrogant. Consider how Paul describes these Christians in the passage that was read. He says to them, brothers and sisters, think of what many of you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. Now imagine how these people felt when Paul turns up. These are nobodies. They are ill-educated, unimportant, forgotten people. And then Paul comes and he says, there's a king, a new king, and you can follow him. And this king is going to change the world. These people may well have believed that this is their ticket. Sure, all of a sudden, we can be important, maybe even wealthy. We can be wise now. Finally, the people of Corinth will look up to us. And so they begin to boast. Paul gently, but with sternness, mocks their boasting in 1 Corinthians 4.10. We're fools for Christ, but you, you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you, you're strong. You are honoured, but we're dishonoured. The point that Paul is making is that Christianity must never be mistaken as a shortcut for success. It's not a shortcut to success in worldly standards of success. The problem then, and sadly the problem now, is that too often Christians accept that the goals of the broader society, the goals of the world, are the right goals, and then we think, right, that's where we need to be getting to. How do we use Christianity to achieve that end? For instance, our world has 
for, well, a long time now, but for the past 300 years has been increasingly buying into the mantra that personal happiness, that your happiness is the greatest good. To which Christians do not reply, well, not often enough. But isn't loving others, isn't loving God and loving my neighbour, isn't service, isn't that the greatest good? No, too often we've said, you know what, I think you're right. But Christianity, that is a great vehicle to get us all there. Why don't you become a Christian? Because Jesus will make you happy. You see, in our corner of Sydney, we value beauty, whether in our homes or in our hairdressers. We value success in our education or sport or in our work and families. We value experience, whether travel or romance or food or having kids or grandkids. And it's so easy to think that Jesus will provide these things or at least endorse or baptize them. And these are good things, but they're not the gospel. They're not the ultimate goal. And Jesus isn't a shortcut to success as we define success. Because God defines success very differently. And I think what's happening is to the church in Corinth, Paul had become a bit of an embarrassment. Sometimes it felt as though not only was he not very successful, he wasn't even trying. He wasn't even trying to impress anyone. He uh, didn't come with power, didn't come with eloquence or wisdom. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, I came to you in weakness, in fear and trembling, which led some in the church to conclude about Paul, as you can read about in 2 Corinthians 10.10, 10, in person, he's unimpressive. And his speaking amounts to nothing. And worse than that, he keeps on talking about this embarrassing gospel, about a Jewish commoner, a criminal, who died in shame. And he has no interest in becoming more eloquent, no interest in in becoming more impressive. He says in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 30, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. You see, here in 2 Corinthians, Paul provides a defense of his ministry and a defense of the gospel because those two things are connected. The gospel is, if I can put it this way, embarrassing by design. It's intentional which is what Paul explains in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, which is read for us. And so briefly, we're going to look over three reasons why God has chosen an unimpressive message to be preached by unimpressive pastors to unimpressive churches with a view to saving mostly unimpressive people. I'll read to you verses 4 and 5. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Uh, this week's been a cold week, I think that's fair to say. Uh, earlier in the week, I went into Paul uh, Gachin's office, um, and he was there with a beanie, two jackets, woolen gloves, one heater next to his desk, and another heater under his desk. His second e heater, I say heater, it was essentially a toaster sticky tape to a fan. Have you seen those ones that kind of glow bright orange? And unsurprisingly, um, this questionable heater tripped the office, office fuse. And I mocked Paul because he needs to be hardier in this cold weather. Well, last night as I was finishing my sermon, I got a bit cold, so I borrowed his heater. <laughs> and again, unsurprisingly, the trip switch went and at that point, I realized I have no idea where the fuse box is. So there I was out in the dark with my torch looking for the fuse box because I needed the power to come back on for the heater, computer, all the things. Without power, not much happens. But I had to find out where is the power coming from. And when you think about the work of churches and speaking the gospel, the question is, we do need power, but where is the power coming from? When a church depends on charismatic leaders or clever preaching, 
or slick production values or incredible emotional, emotion in music or pastors who use hair dryers and hair product. I don't know what you're talking about. But when someone becomes a Christian in that context, it's not clear whether they are converted by the strength of the argument or by the Spirit of God. Now, there's nothing wrong with clever Christians to choose just two. Um, I like the apologist and world-famous Christian speaker, John Lennox. He's very clever and very Jesus-y. Or relatable speakers and evangelists like Sam Chan. There's nothing wrong with having great church services. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul tells us we ought to recognize and utilize and pursue different gifts and skills so that we can use them in the church. But the question is, where does our faith rest? Where do we believe the power of God is located? Is it in the strength of our presentation or is it in the work of the Spirit of God? And here's a litmus test. How do you feel when we don't have a John Lennox? How do you feel when we don't have a huge crowd of young adults? Or when we don't have a drummer, please pray that God would send us a drummer. <laughs> but when we don't have those things, do we slip into thinking, people won't join our church. People can't become Christians here. Dear friends, we have the gospel. And that is enough. Because when we are weak, it shows more clearly than ever that the real power we have is not squishy seats and air conditioning, lovely though those things are. The real power at work in our midst is the Spirit of God displaying the power of God in calling people to trust in the gospel of Jesus. Firstly, this embarrassing gospel, this weakness, shows that the gospel's power is from God. Secondly, weakness silences the boastful and shames the arrogant. From 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 27 to 29. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. Pride is a big problem. The other day I went for a bike ride with a friend, a friend who is much faster than me. He's in a big cycling club in Parramatta and he dabbles in bike racing. And so he went out for a ride. But rather than me asking him if he'd be comfortable to go a little slower, I tried my best to keep up with this fitter, younger rider. And there's an argument that I kind of held my own. There's a lot of huffing and puffing, but I kept up-ish. That was 10 days ago and I've not been able to sit properly since. <laughs> I've pulled a muscle in my back, and I'm going to see a physio on Tuesday about that. Pride is a problem, isn't it? I was too proud to say, I'm not as quick as you, let's slow down. But it turns out that actually, there are lots of people in our world who are recognizing that pride in relationships, pride in the workplace, pride in churches, pride in relation to our society is a big problem. A Nobel Prize winning author, and according to one famous uh, philosopher, this person is quote unquote the world's most influential living psychologist, his name is David Kahneman, was asked, what would you eliminate if you had a magic wand? Would you, what would you reply if that was asked of you? What would you eliminate if you had a magic wand? He answered in one word, overconfidence. You see, he himself grew up um, as a Jewish child in Europe in the 1940s. And see, so he saw what pride really does to a nation and to people. He um, was there at the establishment of the nation of Israel in 1945. He saw how people groups for decades since have not been willing to give an inch to another. And therefore, there's been no, no progress in the pursuit of peace. He's written a whole book thinking, called Thinking Fast and Slow about changing the way that we think. He's written a book that's a best-selling book designed to change the way that people think so that we slow down and don't act impulsively in our own interests, but rather think about the consequences. They asked him, do you think that this self-confidence, that this self-assurance can be changed? 
He answered equally succinctly, no, I do not. You see, people are naturally proud and it's not easy to change. C.S. Lewis, the Christian author, in his helpful little book, Mere Christianity, observes, it is pride which has been the chief cause of misery in every nation, every family, since the world began. It eats up the very possibility of love or contentment or even common sense. Now, God chose this gospel, the embarrassing gospel, one in which Jesus appears as a fool, one in which Jesus is crucified in weakness, precisely because proud people would never accept it. The gospel is a direct attack on arrogance. It is a full frontal offensive on smugness and self-assuredness and showboating. On Square One Kids Camp, uh, where I was a few weeks ago with kids from this church, the preacher slash heavy metal guitarist explained sin in the simplest of acronyms. Not one that I'd heard. He said S stands for shove off God. I stands for I'm in charge. And in case that wasn't clear enough, the N stands for not you. Shove off God, I'm in charge, not you. That's pride. But to accept the gospel you have to eat humble pie. You have to admit that regardless of how much money you have, regardless of how much you've supported charities, you need Jesus. You need that guy on a cross because truth be told, deep down we know that we are all prideful, that we all have this spirit of shove off God, I'm in charge, not you. And to become a Christian... You have to publicly identify with Jesus and that's sometimes embarrassing. But that's the way God designed it. Because if pride is killing our relationships, if if it's harming our societies, if it's undermining our sense of self, if it's poisoning everything, and it is, by choosing a silly gospel, God has killed human pride dead. Firstly, weakness shows the gospel's power is from God. Secondly, weakness silences the boastful and shames the arrogant. And thirdly, weakness shows the character of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 and 2. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. As we look over 2 Corinthians, you'll see that Paul defends his ministry and way of life, even going so far as to invite the Corinthians to boast in him. This is because boasting in Paul and his ministry is, in effect, boasting in the gospel because, by design, the heart of Paul's life and ministry reflect the heart of Jesus. In simpler terms, Christian ministry must look like, and this is not rocket science, Christian ministry must look like Christ. Sebastian, our youngest, is playing football this season. They've not had many wins, but yesterday they had a win, 3-0. And their coach, one of the dads, Matt, he's an excellent coach. He does a good job of challenging the competitive kids. He encourages the less capable kids. He's patient with the space cadet kids. He's working on their technical game, but he's also got lollies. (laughs) And the team's way of playing is slowly taking on the character of the coach. They listen to him. We kick with our laces, not our toes. We get our chicken wings out so that we can push other people out of the way. And when we tackle, we are brave. We don't just stick our toe in. No, we go in like little bulldozers. Christian ministry has a particular shape because we all listen to the same coach. And if your life and ministry, and that might be a ministry of welcoming people at the door or making espresso coffee or sending a text to encourage someone through the week or praying, if your life and ministry doesn't look like or at least aspire to look like Jesus, then it's not authentically Christian ministry. But what does it mean to look like Jesus? What are the hallmarks of Jesus' life and ministry? Well, you can't read the Gospels and not realise that Jesus is powerful. He is a miracle worker after all. And you can't not realise that he's wise because to this day, spiritual and secular people quote Jesus' words. 
So yes, he's powerful. Yes, he's wise. But the heart of Jesus' life, the heart of his mission is seen at the cross. And when you look at the cross, what do you see? You see weakness. You see foolishness. You see humility and love. In 2 Corinthians 10 verse 1, Paul says, By the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. This is the heart of Jesus, humility and gentleness. This is what sets him apart more than any other thing. It's not that he has authority, though he does. It's not that he's clever, sure he is. It's that he uses those things in order to serve others. That Jesus is humble enough to become a human being, gentle enough to care for sinners, loving enough to die for sinners, to die for me. Dane Ortland, a pastor and author, says this in his beautiful little book, Gentle and Lowly. For the penitent, that is for Christians, Jesus' heart of gentle embrace is never overwhelmed by our sins and foibles and insecurities and doubts and anxieties and failures. For lowly gentleness is not one way that Jesus occasionally acts towards others. Gentleness is who he is. It is his heart. He can't ungentle himself towards those who are his own any more than you or I can change our eye colour. It's who we are. And gentleness is who he is. This is the gospel that Christ humbled himself for us. And that is more important, more powerful than any authority or wisdom that the world can offer. So we in this church will not preach anything other than Christ. And there will be some who will turn up their nose at this silly religious man on a cross and see in him nothing but a weakling and a fool. But some will look on the cross of Christ and by the Holy Spirit, when they squint, they will begin to see something beautiful, something powerful, something wise, someone humble, gentle and good. And all of a sudden, looking silly in the eyes of the world doesn't seem to matter all that much anymore. And even in our suffering, those things seem light and momentary. And our boasting is silenced and transformed to praise. Because in this embarrassing gospel, we have found one who is worth boasting about. Amen. Thanks for listening. We trust today's message encouraged you as you follow Jesus. For more information about Emmanuel Church, please visit our website, glenhaven.church. Until next time, bye for now.